Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and today is our next presidential series installment, and we're taking a look at the 29th President of the United States, Warren G. Harding. And before I get into Warren G. Harding, of course, you know what you have to do. Hit subscribe down below, give us a like and a thumbs up, leave those comments and questions, because we love those. We love the interaction with all our subscribers, and of course, hit that little notification bell so you can be notified when we release a new video, which, if Henry was here, he would let you know, is every single week. So now, sit back, because we're gonna take a look at the life, legacy, presidency, and death of our 29th president of the United States. In this, our next presidential series installment, looking at Warren G. Harding. And this is Dead History. Hey guys, TJ back with you, and yep, behind me, the 29th President of the United States, Warren G. Harding. And I got some really cool, fascinating things to tell you about Warren G. Harding. As I'm sure many of you know, if you're a presidential fan and a historian, somebody who likes history, his cabinet was filled with corruption and scandal. I mean, probably more so than any other president we've ever had, including Ulysses S. Grant. So yes, we're going to get into all of the corruption, the scandals, everything surrounding Harding's cabinet. In fact, in kind of that vein of his cabinet and the corruption and scandal, there's a story, or rumored story at least, that one of his cabinet members who committed some really, really scandalous things, he actually was invited to the White House by Harding because Harding found out what he did, and the story goes... Harding pinned him up against the wall and strangled him. Yeah, and then he kicked him out of the White House. So we're going to get into all that. I'm going to tell you all about that story, all about the scandals. And as a matter of fact, there may even be a possibility that we visit the gravesite of that man who was supposedly strangled by Warren G. Harding. So yeah, stay tuned for that. And then, of course, his memorial, his tomb and his memorial there in Marion, Ohio, is actually really cool. It's one of, like, the first big over-the-top memorials ever erected for a, a president. I mean, Grant's is obviously huge there in New York, Grant's tomb, but this is one of like the really biggest, most magnificent ones that I can remember uh, visiting when I was there in Marion, Ohio last year. So stay tuned for that, of course. Of course, you did the likes, you did the subscribes, you did the comments and questions, you did it all. So now it's time. If Henry was here, he'd tell you, get out those potato chips and soda. Get out the pretzels and sit back and relax because we're going to take a look in our next presidential series installment here at the man behind me, the 29th president of the United States, by the way, who died in office. So stay tuned for that also. Warren G. Harding. Enjoy it. Hey guys, welcome. TJ here with Dead History and... This is our next presidential series installment, of course, taking a look at the 29th president of the United States, Warren G. Harding. Uh, I am flying solo this week. Henry's not with me. And I am doing the audio version of this uh, in a bit of a different area of my home. Uh, so I hope it sounds just as, uh, you know, decent as it always has. Um, you know, hopefully that that's the case. If, uh, if there's a big change, uh, definitely leave me a comment and let me know, but you know, hopefully there won't be. So, uh, since I am flying solo, I'm going to jump right in here. Uh, obviously part one, like I always tell you, we're going to be looking at the, uh, childhood and the early life and early political life and that sort of thing of, uh, Warren G. Harding. And then, obviously, in part two, we'll tackle the presidency and death and that sort of thing. So, here we go. Warren Harding. He was born on November 2nd of 1865 in Blooming Grove, Ohio. He was nicknamed Winnie as a small child. He was the eldest of eight children born to George Tryon Harding, usually known as Tryon, and Phoebe Elizabeth Dickerson Hardy. 
Phoebe was a state licensed midwife. Tryon was uh, farmed and taught school near Mount Gilead. Through apprenticeship study and a year of medical school, Tryon became a doctor and started a small practice. Some of Harding's mother's ancestors were Dutch, including the wealthy Van Kirk family. Harding also had ancestors from England, Wales, and Scotland. So pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff about uh, his parents and that sort of thing. Another little interesting fact I'll read to you guys here uh, about Harding uh, and the uh, whole uh, doctor thing as I kind of just touched on a little bit. Um, he was the son of two doctors. Uh, Warren G. Harding's parents, George Tryon or Trion or Tryon uh, and Phoebe Elizabeth Dickerson were both doctors. They originally lived on a farm, but decided to go into medical practice as a means of providing their, uh, their family with a better life. While Dr. Harding opened his office in a small town in Ohio, his wife practiced as a midwife. So very cool. Very cool stuff. All right, here we go. Moving on here. Uh, now. It was rumored by a political opponent in Blooming Grove that one of Harding's great-grandmothers was African-American. His great-grandfather, Amos Harding, claimed that a thief who had been caught in the act by the family started the rumor in an attempt at extortion or revenge. In 2015, genetic testing of Harding's descendants determined, with more than a 95% chance of accuracy, that he lacked sub Saharan African forebears within four generations. So uh, that proved not to be true, of course. In 1870, the Harding family, who were abolitionists, moved to Caledonia, where Tryon acquired the Argus, a local weekly newspaper. Paper. At the Argus, Harding, from the age of 11, learned the basics of the newspaper business. And in the late 1879, at the age of 14, Warren Harding enrolled at his father's alma mater, Ohio's Ohio Central College in Iberia, where he proved an adept, adept student. He and a friend put out a small newspaper, the Iberia Spectator, during their final year at Ohio Central, intended to appeal to both the college and the town. During this final year, the Harding family moved to Marion, about six miles from uh, Caledonia. And when he graduated in 1882, Warren Harding joined them there in Marion, Ohio. Pretty cool stuff. In Harding's youth, the majority of the population still lived on farms and in small towns. He would spend much of his life in Marion, a small city in rural central Ohio, and would become closely associated with it. When Harding rose to high office, he made clear his love of Marion and its way of life, telling of the many young Marionette, Marionites who had left and enjoyed success elsewhere, while suggesting that the man, once the pride of the school, who had remained behind and become, um, become a janitor, was the happiest one of the lot. Upon graduating, Harding had stints as a teacher and as an insurance man and made a brief attempt at studying law. He then raised $300, which is the equivalent to $8,300 in 2020, in partnership with others to purchase a failing newspaper, the Marion Star, weakest of uh, the city's, of growing city's three papers, and it's only daily. The 18-year-old Harding used the railroad pass that came with the paper to attend the 1884 Republican National Convention where he hobnobbed with better-known journalists and supported the presidential nominee, former Secretary of State James G. Blaine. Harding returned from Chicago to find that the paper had be been reclaimed by the sheriff. During the election campaign, Harding worked for the Marion Democratic Mirror and was annoyed at having to praise the Democratic presidential nominee, New York Governor Grover Cleveland, who won the election. Afterward, with the financial aid of his father, the budding newspaper man redeemed the paper. 
Through the later years of the 1880s, Warren Harding built the star. The city of Marion tended to vote Republican, as did Ohio, but Marion County was Democratic. Accordingly, Harding adopted a tempered editorial stance, declaring the Daily Star nonpartisan and circulating a weekly edition that was moderate Republican. This policy attracted advertisers and put the town's Republican Weekly out of business. According to his biographer, Andrew Sinclair, the success of Harding with the Star was certainly in the model of Horatio Alger. He started with nothing and through working, stalling, bluffing, withholding payments, borrowing back wages, boasting and manipulating, he turned a dying rag into a powerful small town newspaper. Much of his success had to do with his good looks, affability, enthusiasm, and persistence. But he was also lucky. As someone once pointed out, cleverness will take a man far, but he cannot do anything without good fortune. Pretty cool stuff there. So let me see here. Moving on now. Okay, moving on. The population of Marion grew from 4,000 in 1880 to twice that in 1890, increasing to 12,000 by 1900. This growth helped the star and Harding did his best to promote the city, purchasing stock in many local enterprises. Although a few of these turned out badly, he was in general, he was in general successful as an investor, leaving an estate of $850,000 in 1923, which would be the equivalent to $12.9 million in 2020. According to Harding biographer and former White House counsel John Dean, Harding's civic influence was that of an activist who used his editorial page to effectively keep his nose and a prodding voice in all the town's public business. To date, Harding is the only U.S. president to have had full-time journalism experience. He became an ardent supporter of Governor Joseph B. Foraker, a Republican. Harding first came to know Florence King, five years older than he, as the daughter of a local banker and developer. Amos Kling was a man accustomed to getting his way, but Harding attacked him relentlessly in the paper. Amos involved Florence in all his affairs, taking her to work from the time she could walk. As hard-headed as her father, Florence came into conflict with him after returning from music college. After she eloped with Pete DeWolf and returned to marry him without DeWolf, but with an infant called Marshall, Amos agreed to raise the boy but would not support Florence, who made a living as a piano teacher. One of her students was Harding's sister, Charity, and by 1886, Florence King had obtained a divorce and she and Harding were courting, though who was pursuing, pursuing whom is uncertain, depending on who later told the story of their romance. A truce between the Klings were snuffed out by the budding match. Amos believed that the Hardings had African American blood and was also offended by Harding's editorial stances. He started to spread rumors of Harding's supposed black heritage and encouraged local businessmen to boycott Harding's business interests. When Harding found out what Kling was doing, he warned Kling that he would beat the tar out of the little man if he didn't cease. The Hardings were married on July 8th of 1891 at their new home on Mount Vernon Avenue in Marion, which they had designed together in the Queen Anne style. The marriage produced no children. Harding affectionately called his wife the Duchess for a character in a serial from the New York Sun who kept a close eye on the Duke and their money. Florence Harding became deeply involved in her husband's career, both at the Star and after he entered politics. Exhibiting her father's determination and business sense, she helped turn the Star into a profitable enterprise through her tight management of the paper's circulation department. She has been credited with helping Harding achieve more than he might have alone. Some have, have suggested that she pushed him all the way to the White House. However, uh, upon a lot of further research, 
this is kind of a misconception that Harding's wife was the only reason behind him, uh, you know, running for president and doing that sort of thing. It's not actually true. Yeah, she was, you know, influential, don't get me wrong. However, uh, you know, Harding definitely had a desire uh, to be in politics and have a political career. It was not just uh, spawned strictly from uh, his wife. Just to read you a couple side notes here from things I kind of touched on already. Savvy First later, Lady Florence Mabel Kling DeWolf. Florence Mabel Kling DeWolf was born to wealth and at the age of 19 had married a man named Henry DeWolf. However, soon after having a son, she left her husband. She made money giving piano lessons. One of her students was Harding's sister, and she and Harding eventually married on July 8th of 1891. Florence helped make Harding's newspaper a success. She was also a popular and energetic first lady, holding many well-received events. Uh, she actually opened up the White House to the public. So we'll get into that a little later in part two, but pretty cool. Again, before he entered politics, Harding owned the Marion Star, a small local paper in Ohio that still exists today. A major figure in Marion, Ohio at the time was Amos Kling, a local banker and developer. Harding met Kling's daughter Florence shortly after moving to Marion, and the two began a courtship. According to the White House website, the two were married in 1891, despite the angry opposition of Florence's father. <clears throat> Stepson Warren and Florence had never had any children of their own. However, Florence did have a son, Marshall from a previous marriage that lived with her parents for most of his life. Marshall studied journalism at the University of Michigan, according to a student catalog from the school. Marshall, Florence's son, uh, Harding's stepson, he actually died in 1915. So, uh, pretty interesting stuff there. Uh, what else can I tell you here? Of course, like I said, Warren G. Harding was born in rural Blooming Grove, Ohio in 1865. His parents had the unusual 19th century distinction of both being doctors. His mother had been granted a medical license because of her work as a midwife. And the family eventually moved to nearby Caledonia, Ohio, where they bought and began operating the local newspaper. Warren was known by the nickname Winnie. An advanced student, Harding earned a Bachelor of Science degree in 1882 at the age of 17. He was known as an accomplished cornet player while in school and also edited the school's newspaper. After college, Harding raised money to purchase the newspaper in Marion, Ohio, which he built into a successful publication, respected statewide. The Marion Daily Star is still published to this day. Again, these are all just points that I've went over, but I just want to, you know, read different excerpts from different uh, sources here. Harding's principal opponent in the newspaper world was Amos Kling, the financier of Marion's most popular newspaper, the Marion Independent. Competition between these two newspapers, two newspapers got so heated that one argument was apparently settled at gunpoint. Harding, however, ultimately got the best of his rival. He married Kling's estranged daughter, a divorced woman named Flo Flossie Kling DeWolf. Her father was so upset, he didn't speak to either of them for eight years. Winnie and Flossie never had children, but Flossie is, uh, brought a young son to the marriage, who was raised in part by the Hardings. Named Marshall DeWolf, he eventually married and had children of his own, but he died of alcoholism in his early 30s in 1915. When Harding later came to the White House, the fact he had a stepson who had died of alcoholism was not widely known or reported by the contemporary media. Interesting stuff there. Uh, not a lot of people, I'm sure, uh, knew that. He was a newspaper reporter before a politician. Born into a farming community near Blooming Grove in 1865, he was the oldest of eight children. He was raised on physical labor. He displayed an interest and aptitude for writing and journalism while in college, later performing a variety of tasks for the Marion Mirror, a Democratic-leaning newspaper that was in contrast to Harding's family's Republican politics. In 1884, a competing paper, the Marion Daily Star, was up for sale. 
Some friends of Harding's financed its acquisition and soon Harding was running it as he saw fit. The paper's popularity made Harding's a name in his community, one that would eventually graduate to local, then national politics. Yet he remained involved in the star, never ceding his financial interest in the paper until two months before his death in 1923. Warren Harding could get feisty. His temperament was even killed during his political career, but that doesn't mean he was a pushover. While editing the uh, Star, Harding was the target of personal attacks by the editor of a competing newspaper, The Independent. Eventually, he had his fill of the vitriol, and Harding exploded, telling the man he would mop up the street with him if he alleged slander didn't stop. And then Harding continued, I'll go over, go over and mop up your office with what remains. Pretty interesting stuff. A little feisty there, Warren G. Harding. Uh, and, and interesting. All right, now let's get back to his start in politics. All right, so uh, Warren Harding's start in politics. Soon after purchasing the star, Harding turned his attention to politics, supporting Fouracre in his first successful bid for governor in 1885. Fouracre was part of the war generation that challenged older Ohio Republicans, such as Senator John Sherman, for control of state politics. Harding, always a party loyalist, supported Foraker in the complex uh, warfare that was Ohio Republican politics. Harding was willing to tolerate Democrats as necessary to a two-party system, but had only contempt for those who bolted the Republican Party to join the third-party movements. He was a delegate to the Republican State Convention in 1888 at the age of 22, representing Marion County, and would be elected a delegate in most years until becoming president. Harding's success as an editor took a toll on his health. Five times between 1889, when he was 23, and 1901, he spent time at the Battle Creek Sanatorium for reasons Sinclair described as fatigue, overstrain, and nervous illnesses. Dean ties these visits to early occurrences of the heart ailment that would kill Harding in 1923. During one such absence from Marion in 1894, the star's business manager quit. Florence Harding took his place. She became her husband's top assistant at the star on the business side, maintaining her role until the Hardings moved to Washington in 1915. Her competence allowed Harding to travel to make speeches his use of the free railroad pass increased greatly after his marriage. Florence Harding practiced strict economy and wrote of Harding, he does well when he listens to me and poorly when he does not. In 1892, Harding traveled to Washington where he met Democratic Nebraska Congressman William Jennings Bryan and listened to the boy orator of the Platte speak on the floor of the House of the Representatives. Harding traveled to Chicago's Columbian Exposition in 1893. Both visits were without Florence. Democrats generally won Marion County's offices. When Harding ran for auditor in 1895, he lost, but he did better than expected. The following year, Harding was one of many orators who spoke across Ohio as part of the campaign of the Republican presidential candidate, that state's former governor, William McKinley. According to Dean, while working for McKinley, Harding began making a name for himself through Ohio. So here we go, his political career, his early political career. He was a state senator. Harding wished to try again for elective office, though a longtime admirer of Foraker, who by then was a U.S. senator, he had been careful to maintain good relations with the party faction led by the state's other U.S. Senator, Mark Hanna, McKinley's political manager and chairman of the Republican National Committee. Both Foraker and Hanna supported Harding for state Senate in 1899. He gained the Republican nomination and was easily elected to a two-year term. Harding began his four years as a state senator as a political unknown. He ended them as one of the most popular figures in the Ohio Republican Party. He always appeared calm and displayed humility, 
characteristics that endeared him to fellow Republicans, even as he passed them in his political rise. Legislative leaders consulted him on difficult problems. It was usual at that time for state senators in Ohio to serve only one term, but Harding gained renomination in 1901. And after the assassination of McKinley in September of 1901, much of the appetite for politics was temporarily lost in Ohio. In November, Harding won a second term, more than doubling his margin of victory to 3,563 votes. Um, so there you go. He was a senator uh, for a few years. And then in early 1903, Harding announced he would run for governor of Ohio, prompted by the withdrawal of the leading candidate, Congressman Charles W.F. Dick. Uh, Hannah and George Cox felt that Harding was not electable due to his work with Foraker. As the progressive era commenced, the public was stating, starting to take a dimmer view of the trading of political favors and of bosses such as Cox. Accordingly, they persuaded Cleveland banker Myron T. Herrick, a friend of McKinley's, to run. Herrick was also better placed to take votes away from the likely Democratic candidate reforming Cleveland Mayor Tom L. Johnson. With little chance at the gubernatorial nomination, Harding sought nomination as lieutenant governor, and both Herrick and Harding were nominated by acclamation. Foraker and Hanna uh, both campaigned for what was dubbed the 4-H ticket. Herrick and Harding won by overwhelming margins. Once he and Harding were inaugurated, Herrick made ill-advised decisions that turned crucial Republican uh, constituents against him, alienating farmers by opposing the establishment of an agricultural college. On the other hand, Harding had little to do and he did it very well. His responsibility to preside over the state Senate allowed him to increase his growing network of political contacts. Harding and others envisioned a successful gubernatorial run in 1905, but Herrick refused to stand aside. And in early 1905, Harding announced he would accept nomination as governor if offered, but faced with anger of leaders such as Cox, Foraker, and Dick, announced he would seek no office in 1905. Herrick was defeated, but his new running mate, Andrew L. Harris, was elected and succeeded as governor after five months in office on the death of Democratic Democrat John M. Pattinson. One Republican official wrote to Harding, aren't you sorry Dick wouldn't let you run for lieutenant governor? In addition to helping pick a president, Ohio voters in 1908 were to choose the legislators who would decide whether to reelect Foraker. The senator had quarreled with President Roosevelt over the Brownsville affair. Though Foraker had little chance of winning, he sought the Republican presidential nomination against, against his fellow Cincinnatian. Secretary of War William Howard Taft. Uh, Foraker, obviously, that didn't work out. We know that. Um, and then, fast-forwarding a little bit, Harding sought and gained the 1910 Republican gubernatorial nomination. And at that time the party was deeply divided between progressive and conservative wings and could not defeat the United Democrats. He lost the election to incumbent Judson Harmon. Um, Harry Daughtry managed Harding's campaign, but the defeated candidate did not hold the loss against him. Despite the growing rift between them, both President Taft and former President Roosevelt came to Ohio to campaign for Harding but their quarrels split the Republican Party and helped assure Harding's defeat. The party split grew, and in 1912, Taft and Roosevelt were rivals for the Republican nomination. As we know, it was bitterly divided, um, and at Taft's request, Harding gave a speech nominating the president, but the angry delegates were not receptive to Harding's oratory. Taft was renominated, but Roosevelt's supporters bolted the party, Harding, as a loyal Republican, supported Taft. The Republican vote was split between Taft, the party's official candidate, and Roosevelt, running or under the label of the Progressive Party. This allowed the Democratic candidate, New Jersey Governor Woodrow Wilson, to be elected president. 
Now, in the election of 1914, uh, Congressman Theodore Burton had been elected a senator by the state legislator in Four Acres Place in 1909 and announced that he would seek a second term in the 1914 uh, elections. Um, Harding decided he was going to run as well. Harding's general election opponent was Ohio Attorney General Timothy Hogan, who had risen to statewide office despite widespread prejudice against Roman Catholics in rural areas. Uh, in 1914, the start of World War I and the prospect of a Catholic senator from Ohio increased nativist sentiment. Propaganda sheets with names like The Menace and The Defender contain warnings that Hogan was the vanguard in a plot led by Pope Benedict XV through the Knights of Columbus to control Ohio. Harding did not attack Hogan or and on this or most other issues, but he did denounce the nativist hatred for his opponent. Harding's campaigning style aided him. One Harding friend deemed the candidate's stump speech during the 1914 fall campaign as a rambling, high-sounding mixture of platitudes, patriotism, and pure nonsense. Harding used his oratory to good effect. It got him elected, making as few enemies as possible in the process. Harding won by over 100,000 votes in a landslide that also swept into office a Republican governor, Frank B. Willis. So then Harding was also a junior senator, uh, you know, after joining the U.S. Senate uh, and then working his way all the way up to run for president, uh, as we know. Uh, so just to kind of give you an overview, he was uh, a senator from Ohio from March of 1915 to January of 1921. Uh, he was the 28th lieutenant governor of Ohio from 1904 to 1906. Uh, and then he was a member of the Ohio Senate from the 13th District from 1900 to 1904. Uh, so just to give you a little background of Harding's early political career. I'm going to read you uh, one other thing here, one other expert ec excerpt. 29th U.S. President Warren Harding served in office from 1921 to 1923 before dying of an apparent heart attack. Harding's presidency was overshadowed by the criminal activities of some of his cabinet members and other government officials, although he himself was not involved in any wrongdoing. As I, you know, we're going to touch on even more in part two. An Ohio native and Republican, Harding was a successful newspaper publisher who served in the Ohio legislature in the U.S. Senate. In 1920, he won the general election in a landslide. Again, we're going to get into that more in part two. Um, he was born 1865 on a farm in the small community of Corsica, Corsica, which is present-day Blooming Grove. He was the oldest of eight children of George, Har George Harding, a farmer who later became a doctor and part owner of the local newspaper, and Phoebe Dickerson Harding, a midwife. Harding graduated from Ohio Central College, which is now defunct in 1882, moved to Marion, Ohio, where he eventually found work as a newspaper reporter. Um... And in 1891, he, Harding married Florence Kling DeWolf, uh, as we said, um, a Marian native with one son from a previous relationship. The Hardings had no children together, and Florence Harding helped manage the business operations for her husband's newspapers, which became a financial success. She later encouraged Warren Harding's political career and once remarked, I have only one real hobby, my husband. Warren Harding, a Republican, began his political career in 1898 by winning election to the Ohio Senate, where he served until 1903. He was Ohio's lieutenant governor, as I said, uh, but lost the bid for governorship. Uh, two years later, he stepped into the national spotlight at the Republican National Convention when he gave a speech nominating President Taft for a second term. In 1914, Harding was elected to the U.S. Senate, where he remained until his 1921 presidential inauguration. The congenial Harding had an undistinguished career in the Senate. While he supported high protective tariffs and opposed President Woodrow Wilson's plan for the League of Nations, Harding was generally uh, a conciliator and took few strong stands on any issues. Uh, pretty interesting stuff there. So that's kind of the early life uh, and you know early political career of Warren Harding. 
interesting stuff. You know, he definitely had a pretty uh, big political career, uh, as I said. Um, and we're going to get into a lot of uh, fun facts and, of course, his presidency and that sort of thing in part two. Uh, that'll be tomorrow. So this was kind of an early look at the early life, childhood, birthplace, early political career of Warren G. Harding, the 29th president of the United States. So I hope you enjoyed this part one. Stay tuned tomorrow for part two. Uh, and we will get into, like I said, all of his stuff, the presidency, the scandals, uh, you know, his death, his burial, you know, his memorial there in Marion, Ohio. We're going to get into it all. Hope you enjoyed this. Leave your comments and questions. Give us a like and thumbs up. And thank you again for all the support. We really appreciate it. And we will see you tomorrow for part two. Thanks, guys.